Man, I'm so excited also because this is, um, next week is my last sermon for months on end. I'm so excited about that. If you're new here, pastor's going on sabbatical, amen. An extended time of rest in Jesus' name. And so, y'all, they, they were happy the first week I said it eight weeks ago. Now, they're like, oh, amen. <laughs> but super, super excited to be, um, just to take some time off and be with my family. And I feel like this week and next week are very, really important sermons. I feel like this entire series has been uh, leading up to what I want to talk to you about next week, but that God has a role and a plan for your growth in, in 2022. Amen. amen. Uh, and coming into the new year, if you haven't heard the new year sermon, you need to go on and check that out. God has already been speaking to me about uh, an explosive year of, of, of blessing, obedience, maturity, and breakthrough in your life, and then gave us four ways in which we should grow as a church, uh, both corporately and individually, amen? And if you probably recognize and realize that over the last couple of weeks, everything that we've talked about has been done in community. Yes. Everything in the scripture that we've been talking about, Acts 2, 42 down to 47, has all been communal based. It's all been nobody being a lone ranger in Christ, but everybody doing this thing called Christianity together. And I want to let you know again, as I said every week, you cannot walk this Christian walk by yourself. You will stumble, you will fall, and you will be caught in a crazy cycle of Christianity where you will always find yourself looking for a place of growth that you can only get to with a community of believers. I want to say that again. There are some places of growth you can only get if you're willing to walk with other people. You have to be willing to walk with others. Now, for week one, we talked about the, the need for the church to grow in doctrine and grow in the word of God and not be pulled around by every wind of foolish teaching that you see all over social media and y'all sitting there getting bamboozled for offerings and you sitting there waiting for a blessing because you sowed a seed for $20.22. It ain't coming. I'll let you know right off the bat that that's foolishness, right? You should give your heart to sound doctrine and to right teaching, amen? And you should look at what the, what, what's being produced at all over these different media platforms. The problem with, with many of these social media platforms is, is giving people a platform who have never gone through character testing. And as that comes about, you see that they don't have the character for the calling that they think they have. I said, you have to be mindful. Week two, we talked about community. You cannot do this thing by yourself. The early church was steeped, like neck deep in community. They were always finding ways to be with one another, whether studying the word or just fellowshipping and breaking bread. Sometimes going out to lunch with somebody, grabbing a cup of coffee and talking about what God is doing in your life is all the encouragement somebody needs. Like I'm telling you, if you haven't done it yet, you're in disobedience, praise God, do it. Do it. Find somebody to grab some coffee with. Find somebody new to befriend today after service. Be real awkward. We promote the spirit of awkwardness in this church. Hey, you look, you look new here. If you're not new, I'm probably new. Do you need somebody to go out to lunch with today? Don't worry, I can pay my own bill in Jesus' name. Right, but how do you, how do you build community with other people? You have to go ahead and take a leap of faith, amen? And then thirdly, we talked about communal prayer, how the church in the book of Acts was always praying together. It's one thing to have a prayer life for yourself. It's a whole different ballgame to pray as a church body. And let me tell you, the last two midweek services have been off the charts. Just communal prayer, the presence of God in the place. I mean, this past week, Kyle got to talk. His mic shut off and he says, God doesn't want me to talk. I'm going to walk off now. And then they, they began to worship again and the place exploded in praise. It was just supernatural what God is doing. But when the church comes together with the intention of seeking God, things happen. And we see all of these in the early church. Now, I preface this sermon by telling you this might be your least popular area of growth for 2022. This might not be the one you had on your radar. But I want to let you know that each one of these come hand in hand with the early church. You can't look at the early church and ignore any of these different facets. And sometimes we like we think that, that growth in God is like the dinner plate. You can eat what you want and leave what you don't. My dad always told me, eat what is set before you. All this thing about my kids nowadays, I don't eat that. I was telling my friends on Friday, my daughter, she, my, 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 my wife made a chicken with rice and she had three bowls of it. The next day, I've never eaten this in my life. I don't want it. <laughs> Any parents know what I'm talking about? I never eat mac and cheese. You see there were pictures of them eating mac and cheese. That, how, how'd you do that? That's not me. But in Christianity, we, we act like that sometimes. We pick and choose what we want to absorb from the word of God. 
and we look at scripture and be like, well, I'll glaze over that part. Like, I didn't read that, amen. Holiness, not for me, amen, right? And we look at it, but here's the thing. God is challenging us to grow. He's challenged us to grow in his word. I hope that you're being studious with the word of God, studying it and not just reading it, right? Just to read it and check a box, but you're interviewing the text and asking the Lord, what does it mean for your life? I hope that you're building community with people because this year the Lord is challenging us to grow in community. And then I hope you're growing in prayer. But here's the fourth layer that God is asking us to grow in. Let's read our anchor verse in Acts 2, 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, just like Lewis. That's my fault. That's my part. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Come on, let's take a moment and pray. Father, your word is already blessed, but I just ask you right now that you would open our spiritual ears for understanding and so into our hearts what you have desired for us to hear today and uh, for uh, what you want us to partake of in this moment. Your word is true. Let your word be true today and let it ring deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, the church says amen. Amen. Growing up, my, my mother was overly, overly, overly generous. My father told me a story that before I was born, my, my, they had had this apartment on Jetland Street over there in Black Rock. And, and as he tells the story, uh, my mom was home one day and he comes home and she's taking down these brand new curtains that he had just brought her days earlier that she had asked for. Husbands know what I'm talking about in Jesus' name. You know, we need to complete this room. Curtains, like th- those are curtains, new curtains. So my dad, a conviction there, amen. My dad had bought these new curtains that we needed to complete this room. And so he said that he comes home and she's taking them down a couple days after putting them up. And he's like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, sister so-and-so needs new, you know, curtains for her apartment. She ain't got no curtains. And my dad's like, well, give her the old ones. And she's like, I wouldn't want those in my house. I'll put them back up here and we'll just give her the new ones. And this is like a history and a habit of my mom. She was extremely generous and she withheld no good thing from people that she saw in need. My dad was the guy, if you were stopped on the side of the highway, he was stopping. He was generous with his time, generous with his gifts, generous with his resources. Now, as we look at the early church, we cannot look up look at these texts and not realize that a fourth marker and a fourth trait of the early church was that they were radically generous to one another. They were absolutely generous and that in the scripture, there is a deep connection between salvation and generosity. I'm gonna say that again. No amens there, a couple like, hmm. There's a deep connection between salvation and generosity. We've noted that they they did the preaching and teaching stuff. They did the word. They were fellowshipping. They were praying. But the result of the fear of the Lord after signs, wonders, and miracles was extreme generosity on the part of the early church. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. In the early church, there was a deep sense of generosity gripping the church. There's no way around this, right? That when individuals got saved, they suddenly became radically generous. There's different layers to unpack here, but but layer one is this, is that radical generosity is actually at the center of the gospel story. You cannot look at the gospel, the fact that a God who had everything, he bankrupted heaven by giving his only son, on behalf of those who might reject him, but he thought it not robbery to extravagantly give unto them. Here's point number one, that God's generosity through the gospel graces us to be generous. If the gospel has truly touched my heart, I can then know that I can also have this grace to be generous. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he, it's real simple. 
At the heart of the gospel is a God who gives, not a God who withholds, not a God who says, if you don't do all these certain I do's and, and all these lists of do's and don'ts, if you, do, if you complete that, then I'll give to you. No, he extravagantly gives even before we had the capacity to love him right or to give rightly to him. The entire gospel is centered around this generous God who lavishly gave his son for a lost and dying world. Paul would put it like this in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The gospel is a gospel centered around, somebody say generosity. God is the giver, and you might not know this, but God is the greatest giver in all of scripture. When you look at the, the, the fullness of scripture and you look at the depth of scripture and you take a systematic approach from Genesis to Revelation, you see that God is a God who pours out. He's not waiting for you to, to, to complete the arbitrary, you know, legalistic do's and don'ts. He's just telling you, I'm going to pour out on your life. Romans 4, 17 and 1 Timothy 6, 13 both identify God as the giver of life. 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God richly provides us everything. That's scripture right there. He provides us, somebody say everything. There is nothing in your life that God has not provided. When we look at this, we have to first ask ourselves, why is generosity and the gospel connected. Well, here it is, because at the heart of the gospel is a generous, loving God. James 1.5 tells us that if we ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to us. Psalms 119 verse 169 says, if you ask God for understanding of his word, he'll give it to you. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 teaches us that God gives increase in our life. Not your hard work, not your boss, not anybody else you have. It is God who gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it states that God gives you the victory in Christ Jesus like we were just talking about in our worship. It's because of God. He's the giver of victory. Victory. Deuteronomy 12, 10 says that God gives you rest from all of your enemies. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 8 tells us that God is the giver of the Holy Spirit. Job 35, 10 tells us that God gives you a song in the midst of trouble. Psalm 68, 35 says that God gives us strength in moments of weakness. Isaiah 42, 5 says that God gives me breath in my body by which I might praise him. James 4, 6 tells me that God gives me grace upon grace. Yeah. Yeah. Proverbs 29, 13 says that God gives me light by which to walk in my life. Psalms 146, verse 7 says that God gives me freedom. You should praise him for freedom right now. Yeah. Isaiah 14, 13 says that God gives me rest from my sorrow. I won't stay sorrowful. He'll give me rest from it because God is a giver. Number 626 says that God gives me peace in my heart. Isaiah 61, 3, he gives beauty for ashes and he gives a garment of praise for depression. Like you got something to praise God for because God is a giver. Jeremiah 29, 11, God gives us a future and he gives us hope. 2 Timothy 4, 8, he has a crown of righteousness. He wants to give to to you. Leviticus 25, 38 says that God brings us out of bondage that he might give us an inheritance. I can do this all day. God is a giver and at the heart of the gospel is a generous God who gives. He lavishly pours out. Through the gospel, his generous nature is on display. No wonder the early church forgiven of all their sins, the very people who days earlier were crying out, crucify him, are now the ones at the heart of his blessed forgiveness, who just 50 days earlier, 53 days earlier, were yelling out, crucify this guy, kill him, kill him. These very people are now forgiven of that act. 
set free from their bondage, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they want to give back the way God gave to them. It's a reciprocal thing that because God, I can. We use it for everything else, right? I can love because God first. We know that scripture, right? But look at the the New Testament church. They were generous because God was generous. And we don't often go after growth in our generosity. Most folks don't start the year off and say, I want to be more generous this year. It's more like I want to have more savings this year. I want to get a promotion at my job. I have all these goals, and and those aren't bad. I'm a huge person and set some goals. Go accomplish them. But have you ever sat down and said, hey, how can I grow in my generosity? This is a serious area where we as believers can find some growth. Now, if the generosity of God can change my life, how much more can it change somebody else's life through me? If generosity has changed and done something for me, why can it not do something for somebody else? Romans 12 tells us that one of the gifts of the Father is that a person can actually have the gift of being generous. Well, that is your life call to be generous. And some of you are waiting and saying, I don't have enough to be generous. Well, that's why. Because you haven't started being generous. My mother gave me a dollar sister. She would say, can I get 10 cents? And I'd be like, but mom. Don't you realize I can go to the a g market down the street at the corner of Howard Avenue and, 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 and Maple right there, and I can go and get 10 penny candies? You're asking for a lot. <laughs> this is back when the chips weren't even a quarter. They were, they were cheaper than that. Mom, you're asking for a lot. She would give me $10 to give me back one. Why? You got to give back to God. And then she would sit there and give to other people of my money. She would give other people my dinner. We would have missionaries coming by. We have folks from all over South America coming. And they must have heard there was a smorgasbord at the Burgos house. Because they would come in and my mom would say, don't you dare even think about getting a plate until they eat. And I'm sitting there watching these guys from South America sitting there piling on the mountains of rice and beans. Mountains, Daniel. Mountains. And I'm sitting there, little Louis, eight, nine, ten years old. Am I going to have any food? i never forget this one guy. His name was Boldoni. He came over, and he, was, he stayed with us for three weeks. That man ate me out of house and home. And every day I'm sitting there waiting. For three weeks, I have to wait till the missionary eats. Man, how much are you going to eat? They would just devour it. As a young boy, I didn't know they were coming from nothing. Right? So in my mind, all I'm thinking of what I'm losing, never thinking of what my parents were giving. That's a preacher trap. <laughs> that you could look at generosity as what you're losing. And not what God is trying to grace you with. Right? And as I grew up, I began to learn about this generosity thing. I've been faithful with my finances since I was 18 years old. My mom taught me right. Got a job. and I, She taught me right. My father imparted that into my life. And for every believer here, you should have a generous heart. You should, because the gospel and the generosity of God has touched you, there's no way you can sit there and be a selfish believer. If the gospel has truly touched your heart, then you are somebody who is a generous soul. Now, now this is not a pyramid scheme where you can give, give, and give, and get, get, and get. Because you might give and you get nothing. That's fine. You might give and God gives you a long life. And you're 100 years old and everybody else you once knew, they're already gone and with the Lord. And here you are. You're still poor, but you're 100. Amen. (laughs) He ain't blessed you with wealth. He blessed you with health. But in some way, God always pours back into us. It's undeniable that the early church had a strong sense of generosity. So how how do I grow in generosity, Pastor? And what does it mean for me as a believer to grow in generosity? That's a really good question. You guys are asking great questions today. I appreciate that. It makes my job a lot easier. Well, in the New Testament church, Acts 2, there was something different going on, what we call communal living. By God's grace, we ain't doing communal living. Communal living is when everyone lives in your house. Some of y'all doing that. I'm not. Praise God. They got a bunch of folks up in your house, right? But, But communal living is when you live in community, so closely in one home or one couple of buildings and all these folks are moving in together or you're treating everything you have as somebody else's as well. You're not claiming anything of your own. And what that might look like is in a human terms nowadays, you might have somebody, right, who you go out with or you have a close friend who you don't mind they have refrigerator rights in your house. Right? You, they have refrigerator rights. You know, Stephen was talking about the other day. He was at my house and kept going to the cupboard, and he saw the Oreos, and he, and he ate some Oreos. He goes, Stephen has that right in my house. 
right? Whatever I have is Stephen. Whatever Stephen has, I'm going to go to his house and eat his chips next time. <laughs> community, right? It's that community mindset. In the, in the New Testament, it wasn't prescribed or commanded, but it's what they did. They ended up living together and just doing this communal lifestyle. And that wasn't like really rare in in Jewish times. Around the area of the Qumran, there was all these different areas where people had this community living mindset where we had all things in common, right? But it was filled with the spirit of God. It wasn't like communism. It was communal living. We're not doing that today, but yet what the mindset was was this is that if you have a need as a brother or sister, if I did not have the finances to meet that need, I would not mind selling what I did have to be able to help meet your need. Oh, y'all getting in trouble now. This is the part where I told you you were going to like this sermon. I told you it was going to be the least popular one to grow in. That you have a mindset that says this. If I see Brother Gary in need, and Gary has a need that I don't have the finances to meet it, I'd be willing to look around my house and be like, what can I sell to help Gary get this thing done? I pause for a second. I'm not talking about just giving people money who are bad at money, who keep on spending all their money for the wrong things. Years and years and years ago, I had this person come to me and says, hey, pastor, I need rent money. And I'm like, okay, no problem. And then something clicked. I had just seen on social media that you were out shopping for Christmas gifts. And I said to this individual, I said, hey, sister, I'm going to ask you a question. If you know me, if you're coming to my office, it's going to be real. It's going to be raw. You're going to get 100%. I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing. And I said, hey, I'm going to have a question for you. Weren't you just on social media, like shopping for Christmas gifts? Because you wouldn't give your your, your kids the best Christmas ever? And they're like, "Uh, yeah, but, you know, I only had $800. So I didn't think it would, you know, meet the need of my rent, which was $1,200. So I just went Christmas shopping. And I was like, that's not how that works. You can't spend all your money and then ask people to help you. You can't be a bad steward and then ask people to help you. That's not how that works. What you should do is go return all those gifts. And if you get that money back, I'll give you the difference. Because the best gift your kids need is a roof over their head and not an eviction notice. So what I'm not what I'm not recommending is you just give to people who are who are not being good stewards. Right. And after a while, you're going to know who those people are. God's going to give you wisdom. But what I am saying is that when you have a brother or sister in genuine need, how can we not help? How can we not help one another? Look at verse 44 and 45 again. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They treated all they had as each other's. Selling their possessions and belongings and distributing all has any had need. So as there was a need found, they absolutely met that need. The mindset is simple. There was nothing off limits to God. Nothing was off limits to God. They were saying, God, whatever you need, whatever you want, you can have it in my life. Here's point number two. The gospel empowers me or us to be generous to others. The gospel empowers us to be generous to others. It graces you to be generous to others. It gives you a mindset that it's not just about me. There are other people who might be in need. And the others I'm speaking of in this context are within the body of Christ. Oh, yeah, I said it. Because some of us, we're easier to help somebody we don't know than the ones that we do know. We're more moved by the needs of the, of the least, least, least of these, but ignore the brother or sister next to you who might be in deep need. We see that in the priority of the New Testament church, There was a priority to ensure that everybody within the body had their needs met. And this is not always our mindset. Where is our heart when we know that people have a need, but we lay claim to what we have so much so that God does not have access to it to bless somebody else? The nature of the gospel is that it gives us the grace to be like God and help meet the needs of others like God met the need of us that nobody else could meet. How can you meet the need of somebody in your community? For some, it's easier, like I said earlier, to meet the needs of people they don't know because the people they don't know, they feel good about helping them and they get the attention of helping them. But oftentimes, we ignore the the obvious people around us who need that help. The gospel graces us to help one another. It graces us. Am I telling you to start selling everything you have and give it all away? I'm not saying that. I'm saying to use wisdom and to ask God, where can you be a blessing in the lives of others? And you might say to yourself, I don't like this idea of giving to others. I work really, really hard. 
I want to point your attention to 1 John 3, 17. But if anyone, and, and I want to let you know, in Greek, that word anyone means anyone. <laughs> but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother, that's the people around you, next to you, in the body, in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Amen. Did you see that? When you don't give, you don't close your mind, you close your heart. When you refuse to be generous to others you know have a need within the body, you're doing it from a place of shutting your heart off. This is serious to God. How are you helping meet the needs of one another if you know someone's in need? We don't give or we're not being generous in these moments to be seen. We're not doing it so that others can say, look how good so-and-so is. They give so much. Didn't you see what they did with this person and that person? All these TikTokers and, and YouTube short people. Oh, they get, I gave away $10,000 and I gave away five hundred, dollars and I gave this away. Let me tell you something. When you give like that, that is your reward. The attention of people is your reward. The praises of people is your reward when you do it to be seen. When you do it and blast it everywhere, that is your reward. Don't believe me? Matthew 6, 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Whether we like it or not, when people post this stuff, is they want to be praised. Look what I'm doing. He says right there, don't do that. This is Jesus talking. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. I don't know about you. i rather get a reward from God than an attaboy from Josh Samuel. I'd rather get a reward from God than a like from Danny. I'd rather get a reward from God than a thousand comments of what a great heart you got. I want a reward from the Lord. But when you get to the needy, verse 3, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Grace empowers us to be generous, not prideful. Amen. Grace empowers us to be generous, not prideful. They have this single mindset. Nothing is off limits to the Lord. God, whatever you want, it's available to you. And I ask you this question, do you have that mindset that anything you have is available to your brother or sister in Christ? And this is where community really matters because if you're deeply in community with people and you see them in need and you don't help them meet their need, what does it say about you? Well, according to 1 John 3, 17, it says that Christ might not be in you and that you close your heart to others. How can you say that love is there if you are not reciprocating the generosity God has given you and giving it to others? The gospel empowers me to be generous. It has touched my life. It has given me what I could never pay. How can I not give back to others? To recap, I'll close with this thought. God's generosity through the gospel, it graces us to be generous. It's because generosity has changed our life that we, somebody say we, not change we to a me, I, I can be generous. Now, secondly, the object of that generosity is not just a random individual. It's a brother or sister in Christ. It's other people who are the object of this generosity. This is somewhere, I'm telling you, we need to grow in this to help meet the needs of people. Here's point number three. The gospel empowers us to be generous to God. It doesn't just empower me to be generous to other people. It also empowers me to be generous to the Lord. As believers, we're both generous to God and others. In Acts 2, we see believers sharing their possessions and selling stuff to meet the needs of others. But in Acts 4, 34 through 36, we see a man named Barnabas sell land, and he brings that offering to the feet of the apostles. In other words, he brings that offering to the ministry itself. And this is not uncommon. Every ministry has a treasury. Yeah. We know Jesus' ministry had a treasury. We know this because the book of John tells us that a guy named Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, he was the, he was the accounts payable at Jesus' ministry. He was his accountant. He was his treasure. And, and one verse, it says that he was stealing from Jesus' ministry. So we know that even the ministry of Jesus took in offerings and resources. Much like the apostles are receiving offerings now. And we see a shift now in Acts chapter 4 where now people start giving to the ministry and they start sowing their belongings into the ministry and their resources. And here's why. Because they wanted to feed what was feeding them. Many people will come to church to your blue in the face. You will, my church, best ever, best ever, best ever. God's moving here. But they have never, ever sown 
one dime into furthering the vision for the house of God. Again, that's not to put guilt on anybody, but for us to reevaluate our perception of church and what we think Christianity is and say to ourselves, hey, how am I feeding what's feeding my life? Don't worry, we already took the offering. This isn't a money grab. (laughs) But it's for you to inspect your heart and say, man, if generosity has changed my life and I have salvation, how can I not sow into God's house? If I found life here through the gospel, then how can I not sow so that others can find life here through the gospel? We see later in Paul's writings, he was taking up offerings to give to other churches where there was other needs. That's why I have a heart to bless other churches and to be a resource to other houses. We see in Acts 6 that it it went from just individuals doing it now to the church having an organized food pantry where they would not just feed the people within the church, but the people from outside the church. And they were giving provisions. We see this in every church. We see that Paul was telling Timothy in the church in Ephesus how to qualify people who who would be given of the church's resources. We see it all throughout the New Testament. Now, as a believer, we're called to be generous to God. Personally, I tithe not because it's a law, but because it's a principle that wherever I put God first, he gives back. He's in control. It's his anyways. I don't manage my life from the basis of what I have, but on the basis of what I'm holding for God. It's all kingdom. When it comes to finances and money and giving and resources, you know, it's easier to find other people to give to because there's a gratification there or a self-satisfaction of Danny saw me give her $100 because I wanted to be a blessing to your life. And she's like, wow, that was so nice, Pastor. I've lost my blessing. I want you to know that. The new thing is I don't give the churches, Josh. I just give the people as, as the Lord leads, as the Lord guides me. Self-gratification is pride. But when we sow into the house, we have a faith and expectation that God's going to take that and he's going to stretch it. Because there's no rich folks in this church. It's everybody doing their little. But I want to I encourage you that everything our church does, it takes resources. Sunday's production at the Klein, it cost thousands of dollars, but it was worth it because at the end of it, when I gave a salvation call, five people raised their hand. It's worth it. That's worth it. It's worth every rehearsal. It's worth all the time. It's worth it because we are seeing a harvest come in. It's worth it to have good cameras and good systems and good all everything because people are being reached. I've had numerous instances in the past couple of months where people are stopping me and telling me that they have never been to our church, but they follow us closely online. I want to tell every person watching online, we love you. We don't, listen, we don't have to stream online. And we don't have to do it as excellent as we do. But because there's a harvest that is ready. I was, I was sitting on my couch on a Saturday being a bum. I love it. Saturdays are for bum life. Apparently after the workouts now, praise God. <laughs> Go home and just be a bum. And by being a bum, I mean just rest. I have nothing on my calendar and I plan for nothing to happen. So when something happens, I get mad. So the doorbell rings and and I'm just like looking at my phone, checking my camera, and there was a mail lady. I'm like, oh, it's safe. It's just the mail lady. So I go and answer the door and I'm saying, hey, she's walking down. I'm grabbing my mail and she looks at me, her jaw drops, and she's just like, I watch you. I want to be like, I'm married, number one. I'm playing. I'm kidding. First thing I thought was creepy, but that's cool. And she's like, you're Pastor Lewis. And I'm like, oh, did my name give it away? She's like, no, I've, no not at all. I, I, just, I, just, I just recognize your face. And she's like, I watch you on YouTube. I said, have you ever been to the church? She goes, no, 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 I have like social anxiety. I'm like, well, that's okay. That's okay. You can still come. One day, just come. She's like, I watch you all the time. People who, who are watching, we're reaching them through the resources that you're sowing and able to do all that we're doing. I'll never forget, I might have told you this already, but bear with me. We were picking up Pastor P one day to hang out at my house when he came for the anniversary service. After Sunday service, I took him back to his hotel to freshen up, and then he was coming to my house for dinner. And I picked him up at the hotel. He goes, you got to come inside. I'm like, what are you talking about? You got to come inside. And he has me go inside, and he has me meet this young girl at the front counter. And and he said, when I came into the hotel, she said, I I recognized your voice at my church today. You, you, You preach today at the church that I watch that I attend online. 
And she says, I've been attending that church online for over a year, but never have stepped foot in the building. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And so he walks in with me, and she's like, <gasps> I'm like, oh. And then my wife walks in, and she breaks down crying. And so we start praying with her and just ministering to her and just telling her we loved her, got some information from her. But the point is this, is one day they're all going to show up. I'm telling you, by God's grace. But it's, it's your generosity that allows the reach and capacity of the church to keep growing. It's your generosity. It's when we're generous to the kingdom that the vision is expanded because everything, even the ministry of Jesus, took resources. Everything takes resources. And so how have you challenged yourself in this year to grow? In, in a couple of days or week, about a week or so, you're going to receive in the mail your giving statement from last year. I don't know about you, but I look at that and I take that as a competition for myself. I'm in competition with my old self. But I want to give more than I did last year. I want to sow heavier because I know it's good ground. I know what God is doing. I, I see the impact in people's lives. I see the transformed lives. I see the healed marriages. I see what God is doing. How are you challenging yourself to grow in everything that God has for you? The gospel empowers me to be generous back to God. It challenges me because God has given me everything. If he spared no good thing from me, then why would I withhold from him anything? I want to sow heavily into God at all times. Here's the question I have for you. How will you grow this year as a generous person? And not just to God, but maybe to others. Because there's two groups of people in here. There's a group of people in here who are easy to bless others, but rarely ever bless the house. And then the other people, they always bless the house, but they don't bless others. How do we kind of have a revival in that area of generosity where not only am I willing to be faithful to God, I'm willing to be faithful to others yeah. and to meet that need on a consistent basis when it shows up. I want to encourage you. How can you secretly or anonymously bless somebody this week? Who do you know in need this week? Can you bless somebody this week? Young couples, can you find a single mother that you can bless this week? Young men, can you find a single mother whose kid you can buy a gift for this week and not try to hit on them in Jesus' name? <laughs> just bless their child. Knowing their father might not be in their life, just bless the kid to show them somebody's watching, we do care. Who's in need among us that you can just be a blessing to? Because many of you know the people in need. And the scripture is clear that if you know it and you close your heart to it, is Christ in you is the question. Now, there's a whole other separate group of people who you, you don't mind doing that, but you have never, ever been consistent or faithful in sowing into God's house. Maybe this year you change that and you start somewhere. Start somewhere small. I don't care if you just say, hey, pastor, I'm going to give $10. I'm, I'm going to do an automatic payment of 20 bucks a week. That's four lattes. I can spare that. Because I want to feed what's feeding me. Because I, I want to be a part of this thing that God is doing. It's not enough to come and be a consumer every week and to not pour back in and be a blessing to others. I heard it said like this by a famous preacher. He said, how long will you sit in somebody else's sacrifice? Because every chair in this room, somebody else purchased. Many of you weren't even in, in, in this room over a decade ago when they were purchased. But somebody, we, we had 25 members and brought 200 chairs. Made no sense. <laughs> Made no sense, Danny. And then we didn't have them filled yet, and we bought 200 more. Couldn't even fit them in this room. But we did it. Because God told us to. But every, every chair was filled. Within a couple of weeks of us getting the delivery, Pastor Mary, every seat was filled. Standing room only. And we moved to Bastic. I'm telling you that God... He meets you at the place of your willingness and your readiness to go right up and to be a blessing unto you as you've been a blessing to others. I am an individual who don't want to just consume, consume, consume. I want to give back in and produce. You pray and you ask God where you should start in your walk with him. Come on, let's stand up right now. A few minutes past our time, but I want to ask you two questions. Number one, if you would do me a favor and bow your heads and, and maybe the area of generosity that you have to work on today is by being generous with your heart. What do you give a God who has everything? 
the one thing he does not have is your heart. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice who you want to be touched by the generosity of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you want your life to be radically changed and transformed by that gospel, I want to encourage you that he is here today to meet that need. If you know your life is not aligned with God and you know that your heart, if you went, if you went down the day, you might not be with the Lord. If there's any doubt where your salvation lies or your eternity lies, will you do me a favor and would you lift your hand as high as you can? I want to pray with you if you want to give Christ your heart today. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on, just raise your hand as high as you can. Come on. Isn't God faithful? We're going to pray this prayer together. If you're watching online, there are people online standing by to pray with you. If that's you, just make a comment in the comment section that you want Jesus Christ in your life. I don't know about you, church, but I know that being generous with God starts with my heart. When I was young, I gave my life to God. Many of you have made that choice. Continue to be generous with your heart. Let's say this prayer together as a church family. Come on. Dear Heavenly Father, I recognize in my heart my great need for Jesus. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart. Jesus is Lord. I receive forgiveness of my sins. I receive the new nature you have for me. And I ask you now, empty me out and then fill me back up with your Holy Spirit. And give me the grace grace to walk with you. you. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Come on, you can rejoice. Come on, you can rejoice. I want to ask you one more question. If you do me a favor and bow your heads, and we just bow our heads out of reverence for the presence of God. If you're in this room and you know you've got an issue with generosity, Maybe somebody's hurt you. Maybe you've just never been an overly generous person. You're saying, I love God, but I just have a blockage in this area. I want to pray for you. And maybe you you have that area just in your heart towards others and you got no problem with God. Or you have it towards God, but not with others. If that's you, would you lift your hand as high as you can? No shame in your game. I just want to pray for you this morning and, and ask the Lord. Thank you. Ask the Lord to bless you and ask the Lord to move in your life. Come on. Anybody else? There's no shame here, right? Thank you. No shame here today. It's just, you know what, Pastor? I just don't always trust God. Because many of us trust God with our salvation, but not our resources. If that's you, come on, lift your hand. Thank you, thank you. I want to pray over you real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you for every person who is bold enough and just real enough, honest enough to lift up their hand. Lord, I ask you, by your grace and by your supernatural power, that you would not only cause an overflow when they're generous, God, but that you would show them and teach them the principles of generosity. Lord, would you give us a heart as a congregation to grow in being generous towards one another, to grow in being generous towards the kingdom, to grow in being generous towards our brothers and our sisters, and to not go just to the people who are the easiest to bless, to self-gratify us, but God, that you would do it in such a way that we would, you give us the right heart and the right mind, that we wouldn't do it for the praise of man that we would do it for the sincerity of the gospel because you, you call us to do this. Lord, far be it from us to see a brother in need and not meet that need. Holy Spirit, just saturate our hearts. Lord, many people will hear a message like this and they'll murmur in their hearts. They'll text, they'll chat. They'll miss the heart of the message. They'll miss the, miss the ethos of it. Father, give us hearts to hear. We want to grow, Lord. We want to grow this year. I'm so confident you told me to tell the church to grow in the word, to grow in community, to grow in prayer, and to grow in our generous hearts. Teach us, Jesus. Teach us. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Come on, the church says amen. Amen. I love you guys. I will see you on Wednesday if you're coming. And I'll see you next Sunday for the last time in a long time in Jesus' name.